Okay, well now that the recording has started, uh, welcome to this early morning at Hope. Uh, glad everybody uh, shook off last night's uh, debauchery and uh, showed up. Uh, what, what we're going to start with is, I have about a 20 minute video. I went through the entire presentation. It takes about to almost exactly 20 minutes. Um, it explains everything. And then we have plenty of time afterwards. We can go back to any part of this. I have all the slides on my computer. I can do screen sharing. Uh, we can look at this. There's plenty of time for, uh, for questions and answers. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to start this now and enjoy. And I will be here. I'm here in the public chat and in the, the riot room. If uh, anybody has any questions, I'll answer light questions while it's running. If we get into anything heavy that we really want to share with everybody, I'll save it for afterwards. So uh, here we go. And welcome to the Hope Conference. Uh, I'm Murph, and I'm going to be giving a workshop on a brief introduction to GNU Screen. So let's get started. So I'm a systems administrator from New Jersey. I'm Murph. Uh, I've been a desktop Linux user for about 20 years. And uh, just a few things about this workshop. There will be no cat pictures. There will be no memes because this entire presentation is being presented strictly in glorious text, the way it should be for GNU screen. So what GNU screen is, is what's called a terminal multiplexer. And what that is, it's like a window manager for a terminal session. It allows you to um, divide up your screen. It allows you to run multiple virtual screens within a single session. It makes it much easier to deal with a, uh, with a bad connection because it also allows you to detach and reattach to screen sessions um, without losing the contents of your uh, running tasks. And I'll show that in a minute. It's surprisingly useful. It's got a lot of really cool functions. And it's part of the GNU project, so that means it's easy to find uh, on any version of Unix or Linux. You can basically install it. Uh, pretty simple. So, to start screen, you can do screen-s and then name the session. And what I've got on the... I'm, I'm right now SSH'd into a uh, virtual machine. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do screen dash s hope. So what we've done is, and you, you can see, it doesn't look like anything interesting happened, but you're back at a shell prompt, and we could do something like top. Okay, and this looks very ordinary, very much like what you would expect to see. Now, ordinarily, if something happened, I already ran a, a task. Um, Ordinarily, if you're on your computer and you were to suddenly lose your network connection or your machine were to suddenly shut off, what normally happens? Normally, you lose everything that you was running in the SSH session because that SSH session is terminated. But screen can keep all of your programs running in the background. It detaches from the current session and keeps running. So the command that you started when you were in screen or multiple commands continue as if you were still there. And then you can pick back up again where you left off. So what we're going to do is we're going to do if you were normally using this and you exited out suddenly and we're going to close the terminal. Normally if you SSH back in let's make that a little bigger for ease of reading. So normally you would SSH back in and you're stuck. You don't have anything. But what we can do instead is reattach to that screen session. I'm going to not get too far ahead of my slides. So screen-r reattaches your screen session. So we're going to do screen-r and look, our top session is exactly where we left off, which is very convenient. We didn't lose any of the data. Now, of course, top is a trivial program, but other programs can be running in the background. Very handy stuff. And you can see your session, session picked up right where you left off. Um, there you go, I already explained that. Screen will allow you to not get cut off, not have to start over. You could pick up as if nothing happened. This was really the killer feature for me of Screen. Really made it a very useful utility. So how to install Screen? Now on various Linuxes, it's just generally in your package manager. So on Red Hat or older Fedora, you could do yum install Screen. On newer Fedora and uh, Red Hat or CentOS 8 or newer, it would be DNF install Screen. Uh, in Debian, uh, or any of the Debian 
uh, family like uh, Ubuntu or Linux Mint. You could do sudo apt-get install screen or simply sudo apt install screen, as the case may be. Uh, in FreeBSD, uh, the way I found to do this, and I actually installed FreeSB just to try this out, uh, you could do cd user ports sysutils screen and make install clean and then follow the prompts along and it will install. I understand there's an easier way too, but I didn't make a note of it. Um, both Slackware and SUSE had screen already installed in their default install. So, how to control screen. When you're using screen, there's a first a modifier that uh, brings it out so that you can, uh, that it lets the system know that you need to talk to screen and that key combination is control A. So when you're in screen, you need control A to get into screen itself. So while we're here, we'll do control A and then our command we want to run is help, so we're going to hit the question mark. First, we're going to bring attention to that window, so we'll do control A and then the question mark and it brings up our screen key bindings. Um, this just shows a lot of the functions that uh, screen has. Uh, we're not going to go over all of these, but we'll go over a decent number of them. So I'm going to hit return to end. So we'll go back and I will return focus to this. So control A. So you hit that first and then you use the command. You can easily create more than one window or more than one screen within your screen session. That's control A C. That creates a new window for you to use and a new shell session within it. So let's take a look at that. So we'll do control A C. We're going to bring focus to it first. Control A C. And we'll do, oh, let's say um, for the middle one, we'll do M C, Midnight Commander. And we'll do control C again. And we'll just show the contents of the free command. You know. So as we go through this, and let me not get ahead of the slides, we can by number go between each of those screen sessions. So you could do control A number. So let's go back. So we could do control A zero. We could bring focus to it first. Control A zero, control A one, control A two. And that'll flip through those screen sessions. And I'll get a step ahead if we do, we can also do next and previous screen. So if we do control A N, control A N, we can step through each of these screen sessions. If you look on top, you can see it goes 0, 1, 2. We do control A, P, control A, P to go to previous screens. Okay, control A, N, and control A, P. We can detach from the screen. Now, before we just uh, pulled the plug on that uh, SSH session, which, while it works, and that's part of the function of screen, it's better to tell screen, look, we're going to detach from this session. You, we can pick back up when you come back later. So if you do control A D, control A D, control A D, what that basically does is it detaches that screen session. So now if we were to log out of SSH, come back later, we could do screen dash R and it would resume that screen session. But let's do something else. Let's do screen dash LS. What that'll show us is <laughs> that I misspelled hope. Um, when I started screen, I went dyslexic and typed H-E-O-P, um, as I am sometimes likely to do. Um, so that's the name of our session. So we could do screen-R, dash H-E-O-P, and it will pick that up as it goes along. Now, if there's only one screen session available, if you just do screen-R, dash it'll pick up that single session. But if there was more than one screen session running, and you can certainly do that, you can specify them by name. So split screens, this is a neat feature of screen. Let's go back down here. So if we do Control A, capital S, bear with me for a second, Control A, capital S, we have now split the screen horizontally. So now we have our Midnight Commander screen on the top, and we have nothing down on the bottom. If we do Control A, tab, it changes our focus to the bottom pane of screen and we could do control a zero and it'll bring our session zero down to that pane so that's our top uh, screen which is on the bottom paradoxically um, we can also do a horizontal split on that screen 
Let's go back to it. Let's do control A and then the pipe command. And what that does is now that split our bottom pane into two separate panes. So if we do control A tab again, we're now in the pane on the right. So if we do control A two, that brings us to our one that we just had the free command on. So you can see now with a large font and a moderately sized screen, the windows are starting to get a bit small as to not be as useful, but we can see that there's possibilities there. So we can switch between the screens with control A tab. I've already demonstrated that. We can also eliminate split screens. So if we're in a situation like we're in where we're sort of in over our head, if we do control A capital X, control A capital X, it gets rid of one of the split screens. And let's go up to the top. You can see we're up there. Let's do a control A capital X on that one. So now we have just screen zero running in our on our single screen here. Other useful items. You can log a session. So if you hit Control A capital H, it basically starts a running log of everything going on within your screen session. So if we flip down, and let me talk about the next one too. There's also a way to get a screenshot. So just a simple shot of everything that's on the screen with Control A lowercase h. So let's take a look at both of those. So if we do Control A lowercase h, you can see it says screen image written to hard copy dot zero. So if we quit out of this and we do uh, vi hard copy dot zero, you can see that is our top screen that we were running just a second ago. So if you wanted to get a quick screenshot of what was going on in text, you can get that. So let's Let's exit out of that. And then let's do Control A, capital H, Control A, capital H. And if you look on top, it says appending to, to log file screen log dot zero. So actually, let me stop that. Control A, let's do RM screen log dot zero. And let's try that again. Control A, capital H, we're creating a log file screen log dot zero. So now if we did something like ls and then we did uh, cat proc cpu info we get all of that all that is scrolled off the top of the screen we can do control a capital h again we've closed the screen log but let's take a look at it so you can see there's our ls command unfortunately we see some of the escape sequences doing the colors in that uh, but you can see we can scroll through our the, the part of the log that went. So we got two different commands. We didn't have to, you know, redirect them both and send them both, uh, you know, appended to the same file. We can get a sequence of commands all logged in from this one session uh, without a lot of effort. So we'll quit out of that. Run top again. Let's go back. So that was our screenshot in our log session. If you want to lock your session, and this I think is this is why we ended up with this on all of our machines, so we had a way to lock a user's SSH or screen session or uh, console session. So if you do Control A X, the screen is now locked. So you know until we type the password in, and then it unlocks it, which is handy to get a list of all active screens and then choose between them, you do control A, double quotes. Now, there's a command that makes this much more useful. To name the current screen so that the previous function is easy to read, we do control A, capital A. So let's do those in that sequence. So we'll do control A, capital A. We'll focus on this first, control A, capital A. So let's set it to top. Then let's go to the next one. Do Control A, Capital A, and set it to Midnight Commander. We'll do Control A, N. We'll do Control A, Capital A, and we'll just call this one Free. So now we've got three different sessions. So if you see as we go through, we've got Top, we've got Midnight Commander, we've got Free. If we do Control A, Double Quotes, we get a little menu where you can select between the different 
sessions by name, which makes that a lot more logical. So there's also a cut and paste function. Now this is super useful. I actually mentioned this in the description on the bottom. Um, if you're in a VMware session that doesn't have cut and paste available easily, if you are sitting at a TTY console on a server that doesn't have a graphical mode, might not have cut and paste available. This makes this really easy. So what we've got is we've got copy mode, which is control A, left square bracket. That starts copy mode. Then you can cursor around on what's on the screen and also everything that's in the scrollback buffer, which also makes this a way to explore the scrollback buffer if you need to. Uh, so you do control A, left bracket, cursor around to the beginning of what you'd like to copy, hit space. Cursor to the end of what you'd like to copy, hit space again. And it takes all of that text and puts it in the buffer. Then, if you do control A, right bracket, it pastes the selected text at the cursor location. So it's a really handy way to, uh, say, copy a UUID or something like that. So let me, let me demonstrate. So we'll do something like BLK ID so we can see what's in the system. And let's get the let's get the UUID for swap. So we could do control A, left bracket. Let's cursor around. I'll hit the space bar to start tagging. We'll write it, cursor right till we've gotten the entire string we want. Hit space again. Now we could do say VI Etsy F stab and say we wanted to replace this um, dev mapper with the UUID, you know, in case you were having trouble with uh, the system mixing the names up. So we'll ex we will remove that. I can't save this, unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter. I'm going to hit I to insert, and then I'm going to hit Control A, right bracket, and it's going to put that UUID from before in there. So now we didn't have to go through any special things to get that UUID in the buffer and saved out. Now unfortunately I can't save that but it doesn't really matter for this VM that's fine. So that's copy and paste and you can explore the copy buffer which is the scroll back buffer Ooh, which is short on this. Yeah I haven't done much in this one. So but normally that gives you a full view of your entire buffer. So that I found, when I found that, that was invaluable to me. That was really a helpful, helpful function for me personally. You can also customize screen. So it comes up the way you want at runtime. Um, there are example configuration files in Etsy screen RC and strangely Etsy, Etsy screen RC if Etsy screen RC isn't available, which is kind of weird. But you can do things like change your default key bindings, start screen sessions with specific programs, or define what's called a hard line for the bottom for status. Now, I created this screen RC file, I created these top four lines, and then these bottom two lines I copied from over the internet. Because if you look, it is not an intuitive way to go about this. Um, I believe they're all bash environment variables or something. So this configuration you can set if you make that your dot screen RC file in your home directory you can have it start up the way you like which I have done for another session here. So I'm going to log out as user user. I'm going to detach. I'm going to exit. So I'm going to SSH in as root with a super complex password. So now I'm in his root. I'm going to do screen, and you're going to see the screen come up. Now it starts out with IRSS, IRSSI, which isn't doing anything interesting because I'm not connected to any servers. Um, but I'm going to step through the things. If you look on the bottom, the one for IRC is highlighted there. And as I step through, I'm going to do previous. Previous. So performance is a simple top session. Previous to that is another copy of MC. Previous to that is a simple root prompt. So you can see those four sessions are all defined, named, and run programs at startup. And if you look along the bottom line there, you can see it shows the host name, it shows the sessions and which one's active, and also shows the time and date.
which can be pretty handy. So, what else do we have here? I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so for sources, um, where I got my information for this presentation for, uh, the GNU project was the first place I looked, uh, the screen uh, documentation pages for that. Linode had a very nice uh, documentation on how to use GNU screen and uh, a site called Aperiodic, which I'm not that familiar with, but I found them. They had a lot of nice uh, table of the default key bindings, which was really handy. And that's where I found uh, a decent amount of my information. So if you want to contact me, uh, you can email me at murph at member.fsf.org. Uh, you can get a hold of me on uh, Mastodon at, at murph at fostodon.org. And if there are any questions, I will be around afterwards to uh, answer any. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the workshop and we can uh, discuss this further with the rest of the time. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope everybody uh, got a little something out of that. Uh, let hey Murph, you are muted. Yes, uh, if you miss by one character in the uh, chat and then hit the delete key to correct a typo, it blows you out of it completely, as I have found out just now. So uh, I want to address Fondabu has a big question here as far as uh, sharing in screen. Screen had a reputation for being a security liability. Uh, yes, there is a feature that you can allow people to attach to your screen session. That's a really cool feature but that's where the security liability comes in. It is not set to enabled as default. I think that change probably happened long ago when it had that reputation that you spoke of. So by default, it's not enabled. Uh, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops and you really have to uh, uh, explicitly tell it, yes, please allow my screen sessions to be shared. So probably not a good idea at all for security. If you needed for a short time to uh, demonstrate something to someone and you both only had a, you know, if that was your only way to screen share is you could both SSH into the same machine, that would be really super useful to be able to set up maybe on an account, maybe you set up an account with limited access and then let that account's screen be shared. And that way, if there are any residual things, you're on a, on a lower security account. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yes, you can certainly do that. It was a really cool feature, but it's disabled. Like where I work, we're not allowed to enable that under any circumstances for any reason, um, because it's, it's a bad, bad security thing. Uh, what you can do is if two people with root access uh, have that, of course, if they're both root, uh, you could share the session because it's the same user. Can you let someone watch a session but not input? Not that I know of. Graylight asked that. So let me address, I made a few notes uh, as I went along here. Um, a couple of things no one asked. You can install this in Mac OS X. I think earlier versions included it, but I think now they're taking it out. So it's available in Homebrew. I don't have the exact uh uh, instructions for that because I don't have a current Mac OS X, uh, OS 10 machine at all, so I can't demonstrate that for you. Um, there are instructions. I'm going to throw, if anybody's trying to do this in WSL, uh, I tried it in WSL with Ubuntu, and it failed. You can install it, and it doesn't run. Um, but if you go to the link I'm putting in the shared notes now from codingrandomly.com, um, you can fix it. You you create a screen RC file like uh, like the one that I did in the presentation. Except you put a line in it. Uh, I'll just sum it up. There's a screen directory equals home colon backslash dot screen. Um, you look at that link to to get the exact details. But I was able to make it run, and I would assume that would go for other versions of Linux on WSL. I'm not a big WSL fan, so I didn't get deep into it. But I did get it working on my Ubuntu system. You know, on my Windows system that I have Ubuntu on that I have up there just for testing and printing and stuff. Um, let's see. Um, other questions? Can you let someone watch? Say, okay, I already answered that. Um, yeah, what did you think of uh, doing the entire presentation all in text? Um, because uh, that seemed appropriate for screen.
Yeah, be careful when you're in the public chat. If you hit uh, delete, you can exit out of the whole thing by accident. Um, yeah, I tried to make the video nice and big. Um, so a couple of questions. Someone asked about TMUX, and usually I get the question of, and no one asked that here. So this is not a criticism to absolutely anybody here. Someone goes, screen sucks. Why don't you use TMUX? TMUX is so much better. Okay. I usually diffuse that by saying TMUX is a great utility. It does Almost, I think it does everything we did here. Uh, screen does some things that Tmux doesn't do. Tmux does some things that Screen doesn't do. Uh, notably, stuff like your split screens, like if you do a whole bunch of split screens, you can save that in Tmux. You can't do that in Screen. That's a nice feature. Um, the reason I use Screen is um, I'm on a production environment at work, and Screen was already installed on everything. So the fact that one of these tools does everything I need and is already present made it an easy choice for uh, what we're doing. Um, someone noted, uh, someone put in the shared notes the instructions to install Screen on uh, RHEL 8. Yes, in RHEL 8, Screen won't be installed by default. So I guess I'll be learning Tmux. So maybe at the next, at the, the hope after this, I'll be doing a, a brief introduction to Tmux. We'll see how it goes. Um, audio very choppy and going out again. Is that universal with everybody or is that just you? Okay, other people say the audio is okay. So, oh, some people are not good. Some people are good. I don't know how to fix that then. Okay. Um, I wrote down Emacs. Oh, probably because the email, because it's similar to Emacs key bindings. I believe someone already followed up with that and said, yeah, they're both part of the GNU project. So you see those uh, key bindings. Um, if you're a heavy Emacs user, you'll notice Control A is your big uh, control character within screen. You can very easily remap that in your screen RC file. So you can make it uh, Control B like Tmux. You can make it Control whatever you want. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to move the, the mic back a little bit. See, I, I don't have that uh, feedback, so I didn't know I was overdriving. Sorry about that. It's a little better if I move the mic further away. I got a lot of complaints that audio was too low before, so I tend to overcompensate. Sorry about that. Um, okay. And uh, I also had questions about Midnight Commander. What's the two-pane uh, program that I was using? Um, yeah. Uh, Jay mentioned if you use Tmux, recommending remapping hotkey to control A. Yeah, you can you can switch either one of these programs to look a little bit like the other one as far as the user interface goes. Um, Midnight Commander is a real, it's another GNU tool. Uh, it's much like the Norton Commander from back in the DOS days. Um, I was a big fan of Norton Commander back when DOS was still the the, uh, the popular operating system. So when I first started using Slackware as my first Linux distro, when I found Midnight Commander, I felt like I had found a little piece of uh, familiarity that made Linux much less intimidating for me because it was a much more familiar tool. So I, I, I still have a soft spot in my heart for... Uh, things like Midnight Commander that, you know, yes, from the command line, if you're, you know, uh, have something you could do a regular expression on, the command line is much better. But uh, Midnight, you know, if you want to select, you know, the songs that I like out of a list, it's kind of hard to do a regex for that. So if you can just go down a list, tap to select and then copy the stuff you want, so much easier sometimes. And uh, sometimes it's nice to have a visual look at what you're looking at. So that's just my opinion. If you don't like... Uh, if you don't like, uh, you know, graph, you know, end curses type, uh, you know, text interfaces, uh, don't use it. But uh, I happen to like it. Ah, I thought I went over the security liabilities. Uh, yeah, Fangabu, I, I saw your, oh, yeah, yes, I did address that. I believe that that... Uh, I believe that that security issue has been long since remedied. It it can so the screen sharing can be enabled, but you have to explicitly enable it. Oh, Lily, no, I'm not listening to regex song names. It's just it's tough to look down a list of MP3s and do a regex for what are the songs I like. That's really hard to do. Uh, with uh, Midnight Commander, you can just uh, go through a long list and uh, pick out the stuff you like.
Okay, Vegan J asked, I split my GNU screen, detached, and the splits are gone. Any way of retaining them? No. Not that I know of. If you find a way, that'd be great. Let me in on it. Uh, splits do not survive exits and re-entries. Um, that is something that uh, run screen and another screen. You know, that might work. I'm not sure. Um, I believe you can set a predefined set of uh, split screens in Tmux. So if that's something you need on a regular basis, Tmux may be a better tool for you. There's absolutely... Uh, no reason to dogmatically stick to screen if Tmux will do the job better. Fungaboo, uh, no, screen is not regarded as an unsafe practice. Screen, as far as I know, because that was the real only security thing that I know of. Uh, so there is no problem using screen these days, as far as I know. Uh, running as root, would that not allow a lower privileged user to open the same session? Um, not unless you enabled that unsafe sharing thing, which, yeah, uh, doing that, on, yeah, when you, when you enable that, you enable it per account, and I would definitely not enable it for root. That sounds like a terrible idea, so I would definitely not do it. Um, that seems like a little more of an obscure thing. I don't see people talking about it much, because I don't think too many people turn it on these days. But uh, that's certainly, a, Jason, that's certainly a good question to ask. Um, but since it's a per user thing, I would definitely not enable it for the root user. I would enable it for, like, if you really had to use that function and you had to do something as root, I would run it as a lesser account and then elevate to root. So that way, as soon as you exit, that root privilege is then gone. Yeah. Sounds like a neat trick. Find someone that left it on and use that as a CTF. So did I answer everybody's questions? Did I miss any? I tried to make a couple of notes so that I don't miss questions as they scroll by. I tried to get them all. So um, I don't have much to do unless someone has requests. If you want to see something done, I can flip through this. Even though the slides in the present, you know, on the video are, you know, fixed, I'd have to scroll back. That'd be crazy. Um, but I uh, have them locally on my machine. I can pull them up if someone wants to see something. 90% of my screen use has been screen dev TTY using the serial capabilities. Can I do this in one tab of a screen session? Gray light? I do not know. So I don't have a good answer to that question for you. Uh, what would be the point of locking the screen if your SSH did? Um, Lady Geiger, uh, yeah, the, the, I don't think there is a point of locking the screen when you're SSH'd in. I think the locking feature is more if you're standing in front of a server and you're logged into a TTY, uh, that's a much more important feature then because you want to walk away from the machine for a minute. You don't want to leave it logged in as root. You can lock the screen and you would need the password to get back in. It's also useful like on a VMware session. Uh, if you're in the virtual, um, if you're in a virtual TTY on that, if you're on a virtual console, you can lock that and leave it because, you know, if you log in as root and you just close the window, that virtual console is still in as root. Somebody else comes along and they've got root access. If they have that sort of access, you could lock that session and come back. Oh. Okay. Vegan J is saying, is Greylight asking if you can resize the splits in screen? You know, I'm not sure. I am thinking not. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Can screen be used in a Windows PuTTY TTY console? If yes, what terminal emulation should be used? Um, oh, so like if you're serialed into a machine? Because PuTTY is generally used as SSH. I don't see why it couldn't. Not sure what terminal emulation you should use. I don't recall ever having to set it. Uh, gray light. You were asking about connecting to a serial device, Arduino. Oh, oh, to answer your question, Greylight, I believe you can run screen within screen, so I think you can do what you need to do. 
Yeah, you can even have that serial terminal. You could have another screen as a ta as a uh, window within screen. So let's see. Am I in screen? I'm, I'm looking on a local machine here. Uh, I'm attached to that. Let's do, well, let's do a split. Let's go over to the other one. Let's create a new session. Let's do screen. And yeah, I'm in a new screen session over the edge. Yeah, there's no reason you can't do recursive screens. Of course, that might get ridiculous after some point. So I don't know, you know, watch out for your, uh, your inception uh, getting lost in all the uh, different levels. But other than that, yeah, you can run a screen within another screen, I think. Hey, did you see what I posted? Um you can resize the split. You can, huh? Oh, okay. See, there's a command resize. Oh, look and at then that. Plus N will do it, you know, make it bigger by N. Uh, Outstanding. Minus N will make it smaller by N. Um, you could also do resize 20%, or which makes it 20% of the original size, or resize plus 20%, which will make it 20% bigger. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you for that. You know why I didn't have the answer to that? No one has asked me that before. So this is, you know, uh, as I've, uh, you know, gone through and researched this, um, you know, people have asked me questions and that's why I have some answers. No one asked me about resizing screens before. So news to me. So that's neat. Okay. So it's a command you have to run within screen and you can change your uh, sizing on that, which is handy, especially if you're on a large screen, uh, more asymmetric, uh, you know, screen sizes might make more sense. Oh, and just so you know, that that hard line that I had at the bottom of my screen uh, towards the end there, that also gives an indicator. So it's kind of like tabs. It, it's basically like tabs. It'll uh, show you which screen session you're in. And as you add new ones, it'll uh, add those on. So Jason, you could do that manually as well as with Biobo. Biobo? Um, if you look in the slides, let me, I'm going to look on the video here. Ah, how about that for picking out the spot there? Um, so I have that in the screen RC file. Can everybody see, does everybody see the, the video window below me? Okay, good. Uh, you know, I'm assuming I'm seeing the same thing everybody's seeing, but that might not be the case. So if you look at those bottom two lines there, the hard status lines, those put a, a line along the bottom, which gives you tab-like functionality. So hopefully that adds, answers your question, Fungabu, or play with Biobu. But this is not a brief introduction to Biobu, so I don't know all the answers for that. I've used it a little here and there. At work, I use the very, very stock configuration because I don't want to propagate too much stuff around. So I try to keep life simple there. So that I'm used to pretty much this. I don't even do this kind of thing on my stuff at work. Drinking tea because it's early for me too. So any other questions? I'm more than happy to talk about uh, screen or desktop Linux or any of the crap I have in the background here or uh, anything else. Because we have lots of time. This this took way less time than I was expecting. So plenty of time for questions. Oh, the video recorder? Uh, this, I used a program called VocoScreen. V-O-K-O Screen. V -O -K -O screen. Uh, it was in the standard Fedora uh, repositories. Um, it, uh, it was very simple to use. It let me do the camera in the corner thing, and uh, it was uh, very simple. I've also used a simple screen recorder, which worked nicely, but this one was recorded with VocoScreen. Um, as it turns out, I, uh, sc I was playing some, uh, playing some games with some libraries and messed up my Fedora install badly enough that I... Uh, 
hosed the whole thing and redid it in Mint, which I haven't tried to load Voco Screen on. I did some screen recorder stuff the other day. Um, but I don't like the NVIDIA proprietary drivers. They're necessary, but uh, fiddly. Yeah, I didn't use just straight up FFmpeg. Uh, what I could have done is I could have used VLC. Oh, ah, I'm interrupting myself. Um, I could do the camera in camera just with a simple VLC show the uh, the current uh, capture device. Uh, when the recordings, when the workshops get recorded, do they go up to archive.org along with the talks, or are they archived elsewhere? That would be an excellent question for Alicia because I have no idea where these end up because my previous one i didn't uh actually record that uh no one asked me and uh i didn't think to start it so the answer is we do not yet know uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the way that it's set up normally the facilitator would have access to the recordings right after everything is done but it's set up differently so the recordings are going someplace else and the tech guys have to pull them off so they're going to be sending the recordings to the speakers and then um also uh, talking to them about possibly putting them up on archive.org as well i believe but that is yet to be uh known information to everybody <laughs> <laughs> okay interesting to know uh so I guess we'll all find out. What I would say is certainly keep an eye on the hope.net page and the wiki.hope.net. I put, so if you want to watch the video part of this, I put a link to that on the wiki as well as in the public chat and all of that stuff. I put it on the wiki uh, like an hour ago, a little more than an hour ago. Uh, so that's available. Uh, when I see the link to this, I will put that in there as well. But I'm sure some kind of... Uh, some kind of announcement will go out. Yeah, I hope the recordings aren't being sent to DevNull either, but who knows. Could you hit us with your email one more time? Sure. Checking for typos before I hit enter this time. And if anyone's on the Fediverse, that is my, my social network of choice is... Uh, of uh, Mastodon, or or more correctly, the Fediverse in general. Uh, I am at Murph at Fostodon.org. Uh, the Fediverse is a fun place. There's a lot of interesting stuff there, and uh, the link I put for the uh, for the presentation to watch it is actually on a PeerTube instance, which is also part of the Fediverse. So, want to tell us about life on the Fediverse? Uh, it's neat. I, you know, I never created a, a Twitter account. I went with a platform called Identica back in the day, and uh, it it was sort of the 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 proto version of the Fediverse. Uh, I like the fact that different people run different servers. You could connect to different stuff. Unfortunately, Identica had some uh, identity issues and kind of faded out, but uh, it turned into GNU Social, and then uh, I called. Uh, Gargron uh, started a new, uh, you know, uh, service on it called Mastodon, which interoperated with other GNU social instances. And then a better protocol called ActivityPub was developed and submitted to the W3C uh, and is now one of their recommended protocols. I am, I am blanking. I did not think I was doing a Fediverse thing, so I'm blanking on the name. It's one of their it's an endorsed protocol by the W3C, and uh, it has really come along and become a very interesting place. There are lots of different servers, uh, different moderation policies, anywhere from straight free speech, if you're into that, to a more curated environment to keep it uh, more palatable to people. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, different servers. You know, it's if, if you need a, a quick analogy, it's sort of like email where lots of people are on lots, or at least email the way it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Lots of people are on lots of different servers that have different moderation policies, different retention policies, um, and but they can all intercommunicate with each other. So even if, uh, you know, I'm on Fostodon and you're on Mastodon.social, which is the big centralized one, um, 
we can still talk to each other even though we're not on the same server. So you could subscribe to people on all kinds of servers. Um, I really like it. It seems very mature. Um, yeah, nowadays email is everybody's either on Gmail or Hotmail or whatever. But we've gotten to the point where I think things are starting to decentralize again. I have my email on a service that I pay for, um, but I'm happy with the service and uh, I can interoperate with everybody else. It's uh, trying to de-Google a bit. Uh, and that's one of the services I got off of first. That and Google taking Google Reader away. Damn you, Google. Get me addicted to a service and then take it away. They stink. Yes, Mauricio has a good point. Uh, your instance operator can make that uh, character limit whatever you like. I believe the default is 500 as opposed to whatever Twitter is these days, 280 or whatever. Um um, but some instances, like if you're if you're of a mindset to go to Hope, you might look at Hackers.town. I'm um, sorry, yeah, Hackers.town. I'm making sure I have that right. Um, very interesting, uh, great community over there. Um, thoughts on Pleroma? Uh, I'm not getting into that whole thing. Uh, I think it's excellent software. I think they're going down a route saying, you know, the, the original free software thing says you can use the software for every purpose. So it sucks that uh, people with uh, intolerant viewpoints want to use it. But I don't know. I, I, I really haven't followed that whole thing. So, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Uh, you know, I, I. You know, the. People are disgusting. Uh, they they shouldn't be you know communicated with, but you know pe they can be blocked, and you know that's that seems like a better way to handle that to me. I don't know. I, like I said, I haven't gone down that road very much. So if I see people that are that vile, I block them. I haven't watched the dev conversation, so I haven't really seen that. Don't have a good opinion. Sorry. Oh, what do I do career-wise? I am a uh, Linux system administrator. Uh, paint a picture of how screen makes your life breezy at work. Um, it just helps that, you know, hey, you know, especially now we're in COVID days. I'm connecting over the VPN all day. And once in a while, the VPN blips. And I had at one point in the past logged into a whole bunch of servers trying to do patches. And the VPN blipped. So I had to go back and start over with everything. So now my standard procedure is log in, do a screen. And here's a neat feature, something I've been using uh, that I don't have in the presentation. If you start screen with screen dash capital R, capital R, like that, what it will do is if there's an existing screen open on your user ID, it will open that existing screen. If there is no screen open with your user ID, it will open a new screen. So basically, I type screen dash RR just by default. So that way, if I'm already in a screen session, boom, it pops me back into it. If you uh, if you don't have a screen session, it opens a new one, which is awesome. So there's 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 a tip that wasn't in the uh, isn't wasn't in the presentation because I didn't uh, didn't think to put it in there. Um, yeah, it's awesome, and I tried to get some of our uh, developers to use it as well. Uh, do I have a favorite VPN service? No. I was using private internet access, and I'm still paid up, I think, to about the end of this year. But I don't know if I'm going to renew with them, given their new ownership being somewhat controversial. Uh, I haven't decided whether I'm going to re-up with them or not. Uh, Proton VPN. I've heard good things about them. I've heard some good things about ExpressVPN, uh, but I really don't have a strong recommendation uh, for PIA. I did like what they were doing, but uh, I've sort of, uh, they've gotten a little controversial, so I might not recommend them. It worked well for me, though. Yeah. You know, I... I, I I had money in PIA and I already had it paid. So 
you know, my switching point will be when my account runs out. I'm not about to just leave and try to get a refund and all that. That seems like too much trouble. So I'm using them until my money runs out, and then I'll make my evaluation then as far as the VPN issue. Oh, and when I say I log in and do log in over the VPN, that's through uh, my jobs VPN. So that's not something I have a choice or a thing with. They run that in-house. So, and I'm not part of that team. So they run what they run. Yeah, Peter, you, you put down do your own VPN with Algo. Yeah, I might consider doing my own VPN. Uh, you do then lose the getting lost in the crowd of other people on a VPN service, but then you also aren't in with the crowd of the other people on the VPN service. So different methods have different uh, ups and downs. Yeah, I got two votes for Proton VPN. Look, at someone else asked the question, and I'm making a note when I go to look around, Proto VPN, I'll take a look at them. Yeah, I've heard good things about them. Yeah, I hear good things about WireGuard. I would probably look at a VPN provider that had it. That seems like a, a good way to go. Seems like a, a leaner way to go than open to VPN. Oh, look at this, more votes for Proton. Okay. You're putting weight behind that recommendation. So do you ever use a straight console, e.g. not a terminal window in GNOME? If so, do you have a large font recommendation? Um, no, I typically don't. I, anytime I do that, I'm doing it just for something quick and dirty, so I don't worry about it. Um, and when I do do it, it's usually in something like a, uh, a KVM, uh, KVM window, which I can just enlarge. So I usually don't change the console font at all. So I don't really run into that. Sorry, Dan. Dan, Bob, I don't have a good recommendation for you. And when I'm at work, I don't have any choice in the matter anyway, so. Some water, my, my HPR mug. Hacker Public Radio. So any other questions? I'm more than happy to uh, to answer. Do you live your life within terminal more so than GUI? Um, for work, I live mostly in a terminal. Uh, for personal stuff, I do a lot of stuff in the GUI. You know, I'm living a modern life, you know, a lot of browser stuff like everybody else. Um, yeah, I don't do my email through that. I got out of that because oddly, uh, from work, I cannot like SSH out to my own machine to do email. Otherwise, I might do that through an SSH session. That would be really cool. Uh, we're very restrictive where I work, so uh, I can't do that. So I use a browser uh, and... Uh, it's part of the reason I still use Gmail for some stuff, because then I can uh, get it through the browser and then I'll block in Google. Thank goodness. I do a lot of command line stuff, though. You know, if you ever see me on, IR on IRC, I am almost always on IRSSI. I don't really play with the uh, IRC graphical clients. You know, IRSSI is like like the screen presentation. It's text, and it needs to be done in text. That's the way it belongs. WinLink email. Not familiar with that. Favorite web browser? Firefox. Uh, I like the utility of having Chromium on all my Linux boxes uh, because it's uh, handy to have that second browser engine available, although I hate contributing to Google's monoculture in that regard. Um, Need to keep it around for some stuff. And when I see now, I, I'll tell a, a slight off-topic story here. So they pulled Google Reader away, and I saw someone else bemoaning that fact as well when I mentioned it. Um, they pulled Google Reader at about the time that I was thinking, hey, I should get my email off of Google. So I migrated my email off of Gmail, which I was always using my own domain. When I migrated off, nobody really even knew 
because I changed my domain to the new email provider. Everything got redirected there. I respond. Everything was coming through with my, my name at my domain email, just like it was before. Very few people even noticed that I switched email providers, which was cool because I had been doing that for years and years and years. Um, and I found when they got rid of Google Reader, I found a service called Blog Trotter with like horribly missing vowels. So if someone's interested, I'll find the URL, but it's it's horrible, blogtrotter.com. Uh, they will take an RSS feed and they feed it to you as emails. So what I do now is I take, because I had really nice filtering and everything on Google Reader. What I do is I use Gmail's Google uh, email filtering. I have my RSS feed sent to Gmail and I have them go into folders the way I like it and I can read all of my stuff. So I basically demoted Gmail into becoming Google Reader. So Gmail is now my Google Reader. So I'm keeping Google Reader whether they like it or not. So I go into Gmail, all of my uh, RSS feeds feed into there and I read my stuff from there. Um, <laughs> I have a non-IT job. Everybody thought I was doing something important because I saw a terminal window on my screen. Yeah. Some people get really intimidated by that. And I don't understand it. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I did a, a, a I did a workshop on, uh, setting up your, uh, CentOS Home Lab in an hour. And I do a lot of stuff in the command line in that. And if I'm, you know, I, I used to, you know, I wanted to get out, you know, in the pre-COVID days, and I'd go to Panera and I'd have a bunch of uh, terminal sessions open. People would be giving me, you know, looks because, you know, ooh, I'm doing hackery command line stuff. Ooh, uh, it was uh, neat stuff. So let's see, maybe a silly question. If you have a GUI desktop session running on remote hosts, would there be any benefit to using GNU screen? There is less of a less of a uh, use for that. Like if I'm on a graphical system like I am here, I'm on a Linux Mint system, I would generally just open up two SSH sessions. Uh, screen is good if you think for some reason you might get disconnected, but I would do less of the screen splitting multiple windows in one window. I'll just open up two separate windows, but that's just the way I like to do things. Um, you could want to have everything in one session. So you could just do control A N, control A N to flip between different sessions. Makes perfect sense. Um, so Lily, I'm addressing your question. A couple, couple questions back, a couple minutes. Uh, Windows has been pushing UWP apps, which are subject to display modification to prevent things like pixel sizes being so small. Does Linux do the same thing? I don't know that Linux does that at the app level at all. It would be up to the application owner, uh, you know, whoever wrote it. Um, they are improving the, uh, the, uh, some pixel scaling, so you could scale it like one and a half, you know, uh, times normal size. I usually don't mess with that oddly enough. Uh, the vast majority of the time, I want all the pixels. I want all those pixels working for me. So if I'm in a browser or I'm in a terminal and I want things to be bigger, I want to just enlarge it from the application level so that the fonts stay nice and crisp. But that's my opinion. So, oh, scale and layout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Linux does some of that stuff. I'm sorry, I didn't didn't read your follow up to your question there. So, pixel scaling, I believe, is the solution at least on the OS level. Now, could they bring stuff like that in at the application level? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I'm not a developer though, so I don't know all of that stuff. And like I said, I don't even use the pixel scaling. You noticed everything I do, I tend to leave tend to stock. Yes, Alicia, you have a question. Feel free to do it voice if you like. Yeah, I, I was not typing fast enough. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm asking for a friend, you know, just a friend. Uh, if you if you start up screen and then um, all of a sudden you're you're in screen and it won't let you type anything at all. And you can't get out of it other than closing the window. But once you close the window, if you then try you lose to your stuff. Know, reattach, you're still stuck in that no, you can't type. What? Yeah. What you? <laughs> let me see if I can. Let me see if I can give you an answer to that. Let me see if I can verify my answer. Oh, I can't do it. Um, try Control A Q, and if that doesn't do it, try Control A S. One of those. One of those 
will break you out of that. Or should, anyway. Okay, so it now says no other window, which is better than I had before, but I still can't actually a Q. Ah, yay, thank you. I wasn't sure which one it was, but I knew it was one of them. So there you go. So yeah, how do you that's... That's like some that, that's some weird terminal like freeze your terminal thing. It's like if you did control, it, it would be control Q or control S just on a straight terminal. Um, right. But the screen has translated it to screen conveniently enough so you can lock yourself out with no way to get out within screen because you need that functionality of, of screw, you know screwing yourself over. You need that functionality within screen as well. So they put that in. That's one of those arcane terminal things that I don't really get into very much, but have I have I hit that key sequence in the middle of a presentation and panicked to get myself back out? Yes, I have. Luckily, I didn't do it this time. So that got you out of it, huh? Videos, right? What's that? I said yay for pre-recorded videos, right? Yes, absolutely. And I did this in front of a room full of people, too. So I had to face actual humans. Like, here I could, you know pull the power out of the computer and run away and pretend this didn't happen. Um, no, I was standing in front of a room full of people and locked it and then quickly like, oh my God, how do I fix this? And I figured it out after a minute or two of standing in front of people and sweating because of my frozen screen. Because of course I'm doing the entire presentation on the machine I'm using. So once you freeze that terminal, it gets embarrassing very quickly. <laughs> Can I type out the command she just... Which one worked? Uh, which one worked, Leisha? Was it Control-A? Um, it was Control-Q. So the... Contr the sorry, oh, Control-Q? Control sorry, Control-A-Q. When I did Control-A-S, it gave me the... It, it, like, actually said a thing, finally. And once right. I got it to say a thing, then I was able to A-Q and, and disconnect gotcha. it. Um, yeah. Ah, what was the key sequence sequ she accidentally hit that froze her up? I don't remember that. Is it so that's the thing I don't actually know. Like, I literally just typed screen, and and then I had an unusable screen. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember which one breaks it. Control A S lowercase, but it doesn't lock. I, I'm I'm doing this on a VM. I'm doing this on a screen session on a VM, and I know it's screen because I'm I've got a split screen here, and it's still not doing it. So I'm not sure. Control A S. It's not freezing me up. There is some. There's some combination that does that, and I. I'm not sure. Control A Q though. I knew it was either Control AQ or Control AS. Couldn't remember which one it was. See, Control S. So maybe is it if you hit Control S? No, see, that's not even doing it for me. I'm confused. Yeah, Mac OS. Secure because it had no command line. Yeah, so then it's invulnerable. I don't know why they ever brought that back. That's silly. It does lock up on Debian Buster. Yeah, you know what? I wonder if maybe maybe uh, the uh, the GNOME terminal I'm using in this VM is actually isolating me from that. I wonder if I go to a Control S. Ah, here we go. So in an SSH session, I did Control S, and I'm locked up. If I do Control A Q, it did not unlock it. <laughs> Oh, control. So yeah, I did control S, it locks. Control Q unlocked it. I didn't do control A Q. But there's an analogous thing. Yeah, I'm playing SSH, control Q to unlock. Control S locks, control Q unlocks, just like Daniel mentioned earlier. Uh, so good call. Um, it, there's also an analogous one in screen where you have to do control A Q. Ugh. Confusing. Okay, 
the broken screen session is detached. How do I kill it entirely? Oh, you weren't able to re, you weren't able to get it running again. Um, there is a command, which I don't think I mentioned in there. So if you're in a screen session, if you do control A and then the backslash, it'll say really quick and kill all your windows, yes or no. So you can kill all of screen that way. That exits you out of everything. Yeah, PHE, it says pre OS X. I thought Mac was bad unless you're a graphic designer. You know, oddly, I kind of liked some aspects of Mac OS pre uh, pre OS X, the, the all graphical, you know, no, no sharp edges exposed to the user version. Um, I didn't have one because they were too expensive for me. I was an Amiga guy back in the day. There's my, it's my Amiga poster back there. Uh, I was always an Amiga guy, um, but uh, I found it interesting just because it was so different from everything else. It'd be nice if we had more ecosystems than just Windows and Unix would be neat. Thank you. Yeah, that's from 1998, back when the Amiga was, oh, cool, uh, back when the Amiga was uh, still somewhat relevant. I was president of a very small Amiga users group right about when they started going down the tubes, right before 2000. The membership faded off. It was sad. I still have Amiga stickers on my one mountain bike because I had the mountain bike in 96 when the Amiga was still somewhat relevant at that point. I doubt I could find that picture quickly. Yeah, it's funny. I used an Amiga as my daily driver right up until about 2001 or so. I mean, I had other computers, you know, I had, you know, some crappy PC clones uh, here and there, but the Amiga was really my daily driver until I started using Linux. And that was like, I started using Linux in 97 or 98. And, uh, you know, I used them both for a long time, but the Amiga was still my daily driver for a long time. The Amiga, that Amiga 2000 that I'm talking about is in a box behind that poster back there. I need to turn it on, make sure everything still works. Yeah, you know, oddly, I wasn't a video guy. I did desktop publishing. I did general computer use. You know, I had the, I have a network card. In, I still have a network card in it. Uh, I used it to browse the web. I used it for IRC. I used it for a lot of stuff. Uh, and that was my, that was my normal daily driver. You know, all my document stuff, all of my, you know, school work. Oddly, I was doing a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I got a, you know, when I got into computer science in school, I started using Linux because the compilers were free and worked and, you know, they were compatible with what was at work. Um, but I still did like papers and stuff in uh, on the Amiga. Did I do graphical web browser on the Amiga? Yeah, I mean, not now. Like I haven't turned that machine on in like five years. Uh, it's been a while. Um, but I had eyebrows. I had, what was the other browser? Eyebrows was funny because it's like eyebrows. Um, AWeb. So the two of them were my go-to browsers back in the Amiga days. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I think with more stuff going to HTTPS, I don't know how they handled that or if they could. Yeah, Daniel, that's that's a good point. Uh, control AS and Control AQ are meant to send Control S and Control Q to the inner terminal. That makes sense. Miami was the uh, TCP IP snack. Uh, initially, there was like the really nasty, you know, like straight out of BSD stack. Uh for the Amiga, which I actually used that prior to Miami. I remember when Miami came out and what's on that machine now. Um, it made it so much easier. You just put all your parameters in and it connected every time. I know I ripped the clock out of it, at, you know, a million years ago. So it's funny to see your clock is off by 17 bazillion seconds. And then it does an NTP thing and sets the clock correctly uh, as it boots up and gets onto the network. Yeah, we had to install a TCP IP stack. Yeah, and before Miami... That was not a trivial operation. That was a mess of config files and horror show of uh, all kinds of weird arcana from 
you know, for someone that had only used an Amiga and only had uh, minor uh, Unix exposure at all, you know, it's not like I used, you know, Unix and then it's like, oh, I got to, you know, install the, the, the BSD style, you know, TCP IP stack on this Amiga, a piece of cake. I've seen this all before. I had never seen any of that before. So it was ugly. Miami was a godsend. Terminal of choice on the Amiga. Terminus sounds familiar. Eh, I don't remember. No, I haven't tried the PowerPC Amigas at all. I have not gone down that road. If I'm going to retro compute, I'm doing it on real hardware. Um, in fact, I don't even have emulators. I really need to get an Amiga emulator working on one of my Linux boxes so that I can take the software that I love and transcend the... How old is this hardware now? Uh, 98? Or, uh, no. When did they come out? 80? Late 80s? 35-ish year old hardware? 40-year-old hardware? Yeah. It's uh, bad. Yeah, I buy every copy of Amiga Forever when it comes out. Well, when did the 2000 come out? I know the, the, uh, the 1000 was 85. 85? 86? You say 86. I'm thinking when I say the uh, late 80s, 88, I'm thinking because Amiga 2000 was my favorite. And I've got one, the one working one in the box. And then I've got three over on the shelf of which one of them, I think, only operates. The other two had batteries in them before I rescued them and the battery corroded the motherboard. I think I got a guy that knows how to fix it, get out the soldering iron and the traces and recreate the stuff that got corroded but they are, I have a couple of good Amigas and a couple of very unhappy Amigas. And I need to take them apart, take the motherboards out, and either I need to pay somebody to fix them because I could go down the route of self-discovery and uh, try to learn how to do that, but the odds of me destroying it in the process are pretty high. So if I can pay someone to uh, redo that, that would be better. So any other questions? We're, we're uh, actually, we're still in, within our scheduled time. Uh, I was thinking this was going to be an hour. They gave me an hour and a half, which is great. So I can chat with nice people. That's good. So any other questions? Any other Amiga reminiscings? Or, uh, Daniel, thank you for your, for your work on the Control AS and Control AQ and the Control S, Control Q. I always forget them and I always get them mixed up. So I'm glad I was able to get Alicia out of her. Out of her mess, though. Where am I geographically? I am a about a half an hour west of Manhattan. So I am in the wilds of northern New Jersey. I would have definitely been at the Hope Live uh, if, if it weren't for uh, COVID garbage. Um, I would have been uh, there. Because um, I've been to every Hope since... 2004. So this is like my eighth ish or something like that. Do I go to the Vintage Computing Festival? Yes. I'm. I was very sorry they delayed and or uh, delayed and or uh, canceled this year's. Uh, I've never done a presentation there though. Yeah, it's in Wall, New Jersey, by the way. Um, oh, I don't have the address handy. Uh, shoot me an email and I'll get you the information on that if you're interested. Yeah, it's the info. Ah, if you want to look it up, it's at the Info Age Science Center in Wall, New Jersey. If you look up Info Age Wall, New Jersey in, in, in your search engine of choice, trust me, you'll find it. Yeah, Mauricio, NJLug, uh, NJLug.org. I think that's the URL. Well, you would think I would know that. I've been in it for a thousand years. No, it's NJLinux.org. Yeah, it's mostly meetup based, which is uh, still there. Yeah, stop by and say hi. Um, Dave Haney, he doesn't come every time. He has come uh, when they've done uh, when they've done some uh, Amiga, uh, you know, when they've done a, a big Amiga presentation. He has shown up for some of them. Dave Haney is a hell of a nice guy, and he. Uh, so knowledgeable, such a smart guy. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to listen to him talk at nearly any time. I've actually been to cookouts at his house when he did that long ago. Yes, the, uh, oh, I forget the name of the video. It's on YouTube. I don't know if it's supposed to be on YouTube. I know he's, he was selling it for a while on DVD. Uh, 
but yeah, his video of the last days of Commodore are great. Although they do a thing where they have a stack of Amiga keyboards and they run them over with a car out of anger and it kills me. Like, oh, those keyboards are hard to come by. You're killing me. Uh, I never did the camp out. I always went just like for the night, you know, I'd go during the day, stay late into the night and then drive home. But yeah, he used to do big epic camp outs in his abode, which I will not divulge where it was. <laughs> not, not telling you where I live. I ain't telling you where he lives. Yes, uh, Hiltz, yes, uh, 2200, 2201 Marconi Road sounds about right. Uh, yes, that's true. The harp, you know, a funny, funny thing back when I was a lad. Uh, we were going on a family vacation and I had a bad 1541 hard drive and they used to, um, you would bring it in and give them like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars and they would swap you out for another drive, uh, that has been refurbished. So we drove down there. I drove down there. We were do, going somewhere on family vacation and I conned my, my parents into going to Westchester, Pennsylvania. We went there and they were out of refurbished drives and we were going to freak out. They gave us a brand new drive for the cost of a refurb. And I still own that Commodore 1541 uh, floppy drive. But the last I saw it, no, not the last I saw it, the last I recall interacting with it, I dropped it off a shelf and it slammed on the front. So I don't know if it works anymore, but I still own it. Um, yeah, so that will probably at the very least need realigning if not if it's not destroyed. Uh, my first computer was a VIC-20 that I had without any sort of mass storage. I didn't have the money for the tape drive when I bought the computer. So if I typed in something really cool on the VIC-20, tomorrow I could type it in again. So those were my early days. And that was between... Seventh and eighth grade. So what is that? Like 12, 13 years old, something like that. Yeah, and, and I remember I remember fondly the days of the uh the Compute Gazette magazine, uh, where you bought the magazine and you get the program to type in, and it was many pages. And I remember trying to port Commodore 64 stuff back to the VIC 20 and uh yeah, stuff like that. I'm exposing the fact that I am very old. There are olders here though. So I don't mock. Well, I'll mock me. I also hack on my own presentations when I'm there to watch it while I'm doing stuff. So, which is kind of odd. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons I got the VIC 20 is because even at that tender age, I was kind of a keyboard snob because I had a choice between that and a. I think it was the Timex Sinclair, the really small one with the really bad uh, membrane keyboard. I saw that keyboard and I said, I can't type stuff in on that. The VIC-20 had a much of the, the Timex had a little more memory, but the VIC had a vastly better keyboard. So that started me on a Commodore journey. Yeah, still, still a keyboard snob. So there you go. Model M all the way. Model M over on that one. Yes, that is the super clicky keyboard. And I don't have it because it's clicky. I have it because the feel of the keys is awesome. The clickiness is a side note. I'm okay with the clickiness. But people say, oh, you really like the clicky. I don't like the click itself. I like the tactile feel. You know when you've activated the key. That's the, that's the thing. The click is part of that, and I'm okay with the click. If I could have this level of a tactile, you know, feeling and no sound, that would be okay too, I think. Uh, I don't know if we were using best known applications on Linux. Oh, I'm sorry. If, if I missed your question, I apologize for that. Lesser known best applications. Uh, really, part of the reason I do this presentation, Lily, is screen. Screen is one of the lesser known uh, applications I use all the time. The other one, which we have also uh, hit upon here, would be Midnight Commander. A lot of people don't know about it. I really like a two-pane file manager 
And uh, Midnight Commander fills that niche so nicely, and so few people seem to use it. So those would be the two big ones that I would say. Uh, IRSSI is another one, but if you're using IRC, you probably found out about that. So does that answer your question? Those are the two that those are the two big ones that really come to mind for me are Screen and Midnight Commander. Uh, Midnight Commander is uh, terminal based. I you know I say N curses because it looks like the N curses type programs. I don't think it actually uses N curses. I don't know. Maybe it does. I haven't looked into it. I should watch the, I should watch the uh, the dependencies when I install it sometime and see if it actually uses N curses. So, so Lily, those those would be my. If you said you know pick a couple out, Screen, Midnight Commander are my like absolute go to programs that few people know about. Uh, for the sake of working with CLI IoT devices, yeah, I mean Screen would be very useful for that to be able to jump in. Oh, Ranger. Yeah, there's there have been many. Mauricio uh, is mentioning Ranger in there. Um, yeah, you know what? I've never gotten as comfortable with any of them as I have with Midnight Commander. So I uh, haven't really played with those that much. I've seen graphical two-pane ones, too, and they never do it for me. Although I'd like for one, too. Oh, Daniel, yeah, the Windows key, yeah, my caps lock is the super key. Oh, I don't have my screen shared, so you can't see this, but, oh, look at this, I reloaded with Linux Mint, so I didn't remap it. That's usually what I do, is on all of my Model M's, caps lock has become the, the uh, super slash meta key for me. Uh, that's what I do. You know, I realize I should probably type some of these answers. Well, I guess it's all getting recorded, so... Yeah. There also, if, you're, if you're typing stuff on your terminal, um, you might want to, um, I'm not sure if you need to share your uh, screen, because what I see in front of me is the video. So oh, if yeah. change what's um, I, up front. I, yeah, I haven't been typing anything I've needed to show. The only thing I was really playing with off screen was your control A, control Q, or control A, Q thing, which wasn't interesting to watch anyway. It was just the screen freezing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, okay. And, and you, could, you couldn't see you couldn't see it anyway. So, uh, yeah, if I want to demonstrate something, I'll, I'll put it up there. So, I think we're getting pretty close to time, and I don't want to uh, abuse anybody's time here. Uh, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, hey, let's jump into uh, let's jump into the water cooler chat on Matrix. Matrix is a wonderful tool for chat. That way, we can uh, let Lisha uh, close this thing up and get on with uh, with uh, with their life. Uh, yes, Unicomp makes keyboards. Yeah, Dan Bob. Uh, as far as uh, the Unicomp keyboards. I used to work in a used computer place, so I vacuumed up a bunch of IBM uh, Model M keyboards. I have some IBM ones. I have some Dell branded ones. So I don't think I'm probably ever going to have to buy a keyboard for the rest of my life because I'm working on two of them, uh, three of them right now, and I got a couple more in a box in the garage, and uh, they don't seem to ever die. I have a feeling I'm going to be uh, figuring out who to give them to in my will uh, because they just last forever. I would buy a Unicomp and see how they are, but until all of mine break, that ain't happening. Should probably sell some and retire. That's probably probably work. Okay. Thank you all for being here.